I'm Ruffy and Tim, and I'm the executive director of the Friends of Alyssa Hicken. I'm so happy to have you here tonight for our second Valley Talk of the spring. And uh, we have a wonderful program for you. Um, I'd like to go over a little bit of housekeeping, both uh, in person and on Zoom for our friends on Zoom. Uh, please uh, follow the link that'll be dropped in the chat. If you have a question, we'll be doing Q&A after the presentation. Um, so please submit your questions through the forum that's in the chat. Um, we also like to maybe get a show of hands how many folks are members because members make all this possible. Yay, SW members, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. We really appreciate the commitment to stewardship of the park, to encouraging great programming, making it possible for us to bring wonderful partners like the Nation of Pennsylvania here with us tonight. Uh, we're also really grateful to be able to host everyone here on Zoom and magnify the amount of exposure we have for great programming. Given the number of members we have here tonight, I won't, I won't tell you all the facts and figures um, about FOW, but we are bigger than ever before, over 3,000 members. Um, we're doing huge amounts of work. We have a two and a half million dollar project going into construction this summer along Valley Green Road. Uh, loads of loads of things going on. I encourage you to grab the Wissaken magazine that's over there with our newsletter um, on your way out if you haven't had it. And with that, I'm going to get started. I want to say a very special thank you first to the Valley Green Inn for having us here tonight um, and let members know that your membership gets 10% off lunch and dinner. You want to guess, so take advantage of that. And then an even bigger warm welcome to our presenting sponsor, Prentice Smith, uh, represented tonight by our board member, Ethan Burchard, who is the chief operating officer of Prentice Smith. And Prentice Smith and Company has provided performance driven, environmentally, and socially responsible investments since 1982. They believe that rewarding positive environmental and social change with investment capital can amplify that change. So you should all find out more at their website, ProntisSmith.com. And with that, I'm going to invite Ethan to come up and introduce our speakers. I'm going to throw the microphone. Oh, microphone. Thanks, Raphian, and thanks everyone for being here. And a really big welcome to our guest speakers for the night. Um, on Zoom, Clan Mother Anne, and here, Clan Mother Shelley DePaul and Chief Adam Waterbury DePaul. Thank you so much for being here. We're really excited for the program. And we have a great turnout. Um, and I want to give a little bit of background information um, about our speakers because um, I, they all have pretty impressive backgrounds. But um, Clan Mother Anne received a PhD in psychology, sociology, and philosophy from Penn, the University of Pennsylvania and currently serves as elder clan mother and nonprofit president of the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. She's taught and or served as administrator at a number of universities, including Penn, Widener, Penn State, and Goddard College, teaching courses in the social sciences, philosophy, and Native American studies. She's director of education, education and research for TK Wolf Incorporated, a 501c3 American Indian organization, and she consults with Penn on Native American programs and chaired the committee on the UN Declared Decade of Indigenous Peoples and is recipient of the Dr. Ralph Drew Career and Professional Dream Keeper Award presented by the Greater Tulsa Area Indian Affairs Commission, 2011. Clan <laughs> Mother Shelley DePaul here with us tonight serves on the Council of the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. She teaches Lenape language classes and workshops and has presented lectures and educational programs on Lenape history and culture to schools and universities environmental organizations, churches, historical societies, and youth groups. She's worked for the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm too focused on the microphone here. <laughs> Got it. Do you want to see that? Oh, I need both. That's what it was. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> All right. Two microphones here. I think I'm them. Um, so I'm sorry for folks who may have missed a bit of that, um, but Clan Mother Shelley DePaul is here with us and among other things has worked for the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania since 2002 as genealogy researcher, historical researcher, Lenape language specialist and educator. And in June 2009 was appointed assistant chief and in 2015 chief of education and language. She now serves as Clan Mother for the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania has developed the Lenape language curriculum for use in schools, universities, and homeschool associations. 
Paul has tra transcribed a variety of works into the Lenape language and composes original music and poetry in the language as well. And Chief Adam Waterbear de Paul, also with us, is Chief of Education and Tribal Storykeeper of the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. He collaborates with academic institutions on initiatives related to the Lenape people, including land acknowledgments, mascots and representation, programming, and curriculum development. Adam is a PhD candidate at Temple University and a scholar in residence at Arcadia University, where he teaches classes in world mythology, Lenape legends, and punk rock. <laughs> Adam co-curates co the Lenape Cultural Center in Easton, PA, and the exhibit Enduring Presence 2022, Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania Art, Haverford College. And this isn't in his bio, but somehow, amongst all that, Adam also finds time to serve on the board of Friends of the Wissahickon, which we're very grateful for. So Adam and Shelley and um, Anne, thank you so much for being here tonight. And without further ado, let's get to the program with a little mic switching first. <laughs> So is that sound okay? In the room, it sounds okay. I see people nodding on Zoom. Excellent. Um, I'm so happy to be here today. Out of the three of us here, I am the least knowledgeable uh, about plants. Uh, I'm going to be offering some commentary here and there from the perspective of our stories. Uh, but what I would like to do is get out of the way and let our two clan mothers who are the real experts um, talk about the, the fascinating subject we're here for today. So I just want to interject a very, very brief explanation of who we are, uh, both the Lenape people and our nation, the Lenape nation of Pennsylvania. I give presentations where I talk on just this subject for two hours and that's not nearly enough time. So uh, what I'm going to offer now in about two minutes is the real down and dirty. It won't do any of our people justice, uh, but I hope it's just enough to get you oriented. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them at the end, we'll have time for discussion. But our people, the Lenape people, we are the uh, indigenous people of Eastern Pennsylvania, Southern New York, all of New Jersey and Northern Delaware. This is what is referred to as the Lenape Hoking, the land of the Lenape. A very brief language lesson, that word Lenape Hoking is just the word Lenape with a suffix on the end that means the place where something is or the place where something happens. And you see that suffix in place names all throughout our uh, homelands here today. Anytime you see a place name that ends in NK, there's a good chance it goes back to our language. Minasink, Maniyam, Machon, uh, and so many others. Um, now skipping forward tens of thousands of years uh, to bring us up to colonialism, uh, many of our very first contacts with the colonists were rather friendly. Uh, in fact, many of our people married some of the first contacts that came over and had good relationships with them. We had a relatively good relationship with William Penn. It's a relationship we still honor to this day. Uh, Penn was not perfect, but for his time, he was really a radical in working for the equal and fair treatment of our people. With Penn's sons and the era of the walking purchase and other forced removals, um, and the, public, the publication of prices on our scalps and on our people to be brought into slavery under John Penn, our nation became geographically fractured. Many of our people were forced to leave the Lenape Hoking and they spread out all across the country. And today there are people, Lenape people all over the country and continent and world. We have nations today who represent that diaspora in Oklahoma, in Wisconsin, and just over the United States border, some of our people got pushed that far up north and are in Ontario, Canada. Meanwhile, many other of our people remained in our homes. 
And there's a number of ways that could happen, but the primary way, or I should say the most numerous way, is through those marriages between our people and the colonists. For hundreds of years following those marriages, it was all but illegal to be Lenape in public. And our people who remained here kept our Lenape culture alive by passing it down in secret while acting uh, like the dominant colonist culture uh, in public view. It's only relatively recently that our nations have come out and started to feel somewhat safe, letting people know that many of us are still here and never left uh, the Lenape Hoken. That is the lineage of our nation, the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania. We are the non-diaspora, the Lenape who remain here, and we are not the only nation that represents that lineage. Just over the river in New Jersey, we have the Ramapo Mountain Lenape in North Jersey, the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation in South Jersey, and the Delaware Tribe of Lenape Indians in Delaware. And all of our nations largely are thankful to those ancestors who never left and kept those fires burning here in secret all those years. So again, um, so much more that I could say, but I wanna get to the main subject, uh, but that's who we are, that's our people, that's our nation. And uh, the last thing I wanna say before I turn it over is that it's just wonderful to be back here with the friends of Wissahickon. Um, they are some of our oldest friends, oldest community partners. Uh, we have partnered with them on many projects that help preserve the Lenape Hoking, look after the environment, the Wissahickon, the waterways, which is of primary importance to us. Uh, it's my honor to be our nation's representative on the board of directors for the Wissahickon. Uh, and I'm just very thankful to be back here in this wonderful uh, relationship. It's custom in our culture to have the elders speak first. So Anne, if you would like to maybe speak about uh, your knowledge of our plants and our ways of preparing foods. Okay, one issue. First, I wanna tell you, Shelley, I found this book finally. Okay, that's Nora Thompson Dean's cookbook. This is what happens when you're packing to move. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I may refer to her in a little while. How many of you went out at daylight, picked nuts and berries or went fishing and hunting this morning? How many of you ate nuts, berries, fish, or game this morning for breakfast? We are all hunters and gatherers, but let me explain. Let me move back, move back some decades. I was a ga gatherer as a child when we lived for a time on my Lenape grandfather's farm in Oklahoma. After the government removals you've just heard about, some of my Lenape family remained in Pennsylvania, some moved to Missouri, and then some on to Oklahoma. My grandfather had learned Lenape ways from his grandmother who used indigenous plants in healing in Pennsylvania. Before colonization, U.S. tribes were egalitarian. Egalitarian is something I will continue to mention. They were hunters and gatherers. Indigenous foods include nuts and many kinds of berries. On my grandfather's farm, I picked up native pecans. Notice the term native. I got 10 cents a pound. They were small and light and it took a lot to make a pound. But I love the 16 acre pecan grove where I rode my horse to water every evening. I also picked blackberries in patches nearby, coming home with scratches on my arms, tattooed with blackberry juice. My grandfather had beehives. I can still see them in my mind's eye. And I can see what he had to wear for protection in order to be close to those hives. The blackberries and honey would be preserved in glass jars and the pecans would be cracked during the winter. Pecan meats, they were called meats. Pecan meats were not easy to get to. And so people would often sit around, crack the nuts, 
and tell stories. I read that pecans are the only tree nut native to North America. I'll, I have to check on that. I'm not sure. There are a lot of nuts that we have that we use. Sources say that their name is derived from the Algonquin word, which translates to nut requiring a stone to crack. I'll check with Shelley about that. <laughs> Summers at the farm also had rows of corn. Oh, oops, rows of corn. That was white man's corn. Uh, but my cousins and I loved to hide in, in, and we also made corn husk dolls. I learned that corn, squash, and beans, called three sisters, were often planted together. They each evolved in Central America thousands of years ago and would slowly move north. The original ears of corn were incredibly small and multicolored, not much nutrition there. I enjoyed eating the corn and beans, but had no appetite for the cooked squash my grandfather always had on the back burner. Nor did I understand why he so often brought home seafood he traded his vegetables for at high class restaurants. None of my friends ate seafood, only canned tuna in sandwiches. I don't think I was aware then that the family had once lived close to the ocean. I had not been to the ocean yet at that point. Here is the transition from hunters and gatherers to horticulturists and to agriculturists. Our human civilization has made us successful beyond all imagination. First, we learned to gain at least some control over our food supply by planting seeds into the ground so we would not be limited to gathering what Mother Earth provided us. Instead of hunting untamed animals, we would eventually learn to tend, fence, and breed animals that we would depend upon for meat and milk. These actions alone would not prevent hunger from times of famine, but we would also learn to trade from other groups for what we needed but did not have. Trade was not new to Indian tribes. They had long traded distances long ways that we, where they would go from like New York, what is now New York to Chicago. The movement from hunter-gatherer societies to ones that were pastoral, horticultural, and then agricultural required larger families to do the work that would be needed most in the growing seasons, as it also provided more food than might once have been available. Larger families would move people from hunter-gatherer egalitarian groups to hierarchical systems where some had more power than others. Eventually, this civilization across large societies worldwide would find slaves helpful in accomplishing even the greater amounts of work, allowing others to assume the special privilege of class and power. The Industrial Revolution would come to make slavery no longer necessary. That's not part of the history we learn. Um, but what, what we did learn was that it made a difference who had the power and who could use it. We now know that behaviors once critical to the survival of our species relied on the limits of an, the environment for regulation. Stress told our brains that there were challenges and we needed to eat more food to store in our bodies for what was going to be a famine. Receptors in our brains were reduced in order to have us take in more food and other substances to make it through the difficult time. Addictive substances also gave us a false sense of things, that things would be okay. The sweeteners that we love were hard to obtain. Bees had limited honey and protected it well. Taking maple syrup from the trees was not easy. The original corn plant evolved over a long time to become the Jersey sweet corn that we've all come to know. That would become the infamous corn syrup in so many products. 
and sugarcane required slavery to grow large amounts. In the examples of berries and nuts of my youth, native pecans were supposedly improved to have thin shells called paper shell pecans that were easy to crack and eat, but not much taste. A number of years ago, I was told I could pick blackberries in a nearby town. I did. They were without thorns, so no scratches on my arms, but not much taste. Researchers Whitkin and Berry described the loss of cognitive ability that resulted from movement from egalitarian hunter-gatherer groups to highly stratified authoritarian structures. Those with egalitarian and flexible socialization were seen to be more cognitively complex, while those with authoritarian socialization were cognitively simple with fewer categories. Questioning and looking for new answers was discour discouraged. Small bands of people in hunter-gatherer groups helped their children learn alongside their families. Families who could not only teach, but observe special talents of different children that were necessary for the tribe. This process was critical to the survival of a group where each person is valued and needed. Natives and other minorities have often been given commodities that were not the foods their bodies were attuned to. Taken from their lands, natives were given rations of wheat flour, sugar, and lard. They had no milk and no grains except for corn, and when it was eaten from earlier times to the south, corn was eaten with ashes and calcium lawn to release the necessary protein. Hominy was made by adding ashes to the corn from the fires. I have a friend who's visited us up in Pennsylvania who routinely takes her corn. She goes to her fireplace. She scoops up ashes. She brings them back and puts them in and makes softing, the Muscogee Creek version. Hominy is used as a term in several places, but this is Muscogee Creek. Nutritionist Joan Larson has written that peoples who last had grains have suffered from alcoholism in Northern Europe, Russia, and natives in America. When I visited Russia in 1990, I saw some of the alcohol alcoholism there, just as we see it here. Skeletal remains show that natives on the West Coast were healthier 10,000 years ago than US citizens are now. We may want to question our success. As I look outside my window, the native trees bloom in incredible colors of green. You can hardly see their branches for the leaves. Underground, they're connected. We didn't plant them. The tall grasses will grow with stripes of dark blue, deep, deep maroon and green. One year, I measured them six feet tall. There are tiny grasses underfoot alongside tiny wild flowers of every shape and color. There's a cactus that was here when we came 30 years ago. We didn't plant it, although I did move part of one to a place of memorial. The man who first built the house barn we live in learned he couldn't farm this land. Rocks abound just below the surface, and some break the surface to make lovely rock gardens. So we are all hunters and gatherers. What did your ancestors eat thousands of years ago? We hunt jobs, we hunt clothing, we order online. Next time you shop at your grocery store, think about that. What are you hunting and what are you gathering, even if indirectly? We hear a lot about the demise of the body planet Earth, but how are we living out of sync with our own bodies and the Earth? And a final note, something about the gift that we get from what we call indigenous or wild plants. Shelley can tell you how important the word 
Wanishi is in our prayers. We say Wanishi repeatedly. These are not our, quote, successful people who are asking God to give me, give me, give me more, make me rich, please, today. These are gifts that make us thankful and grateful to what we have. And we hope better people want to shoot. Thank you. Anishi Ann. I've learned so much from Ann as well as many of our elders through the many years. And I'll talk a little bit about um, what I've learned from some of them. But first I'd like to go back to my childhood and my earliest memories uh, of foraging, which at the time didn't seem unusual to me. It wasn't told to me that we're doing this because we're Lenape. It's just the way we lived. So my great grandfather um, had a wintergreen still at that time. And wintergreen was used for many ailments and as a rug. Um, so that's my first memory, the wintergreen still, because it was so fascinating. And uh, my mother uh, tells me he had that for many years. And uh, she used to love to play in the water troughs uh, that would come down and he would yell at her to get out of those water troughs. And it's come to me finally many years later that there might have been another reason for that still. And that's why he wanted her out of it. Uh, that's true of some other families we know about too. Just a rumor. Um, so that's one of my earliest memories. Uh, my uh, great grandfather always had uh, names for the girls that were flowers. I was Black Eyed Susan, and the boys were always some kind of animal. Um, and again, we never knew why. It wasn't explained to us that it's because we're Lenape or because we're native. It just was the way that we lived. That was my great grandfather. My grandmother. Uh, was constantly uh, picking herbs. Uh, dandelion was a big one. Um, in the spring, we always had to drink sassafras, uh, which would rid the body of toxins. And I don't think this is Indian, but we had to drink, uh, take a spoonful of molasses and sulfur as well. Uh, that may have come from the German <laughs> background. Um, <clears throat> so those are some of my earliest memories. We always went blueberry picking up on the Effort Mountain. We had to wear fishing boots because there's rattlesnakes up there. Uh, so those are early, very fond, early memories. My grandmother was amazing at canning everything. Apples, berries. She had a huge cellar um, and downstairs. And we would all go there during the winter and just, you know, grab stuff off her shelf. She would just spend so much time in fall canning just about everything. Elderberries, she loved elderberries, almost all kinds of berries. Um, so these are some of my earliest memories of just being out there and gathering herbs and such. Um, in my later years, I learned uh, to use different herbs from elders in our tribe. And so these days uh, I use sumac, uh, the staghorn berries, which are very rich in vitamin C. And uh, if only uh, one of the main uh, diseases of the early colonists was scurvy. And if only they had known about, uh, and maybe some of the Lenape did teach some of them about this, but the large majority did not even know about these native plants and everything out there except for grass is medicinal in one way or another. So we can't go through everything. So I'm just gonna share with you the ones that I use on a common basis. So uh, if you steep the staghorn berries, uh, they, it turns out to be a lovely pink lemonade type thing, very citrusy, very nice. If you'd like to add some kind of sweetener, um, there are ways to do that without um, using sugars, which um, I don't do. 
I live organically. I don't eat anything that isn't organic. I don't necessarily do it for my body. Uh, it's my tithing because I want to make sure that I only invest in foods that will be healthful for the next seven, seven generations of our people. And so that is the main reason I do it. Although, you know, it's tasty and great and good for you as well. Um, other things that we, well, one thing that, that I learned uh, quite a while back, uh, my grandmother loved to eat uh, wild carrot, which is Queen Anne's lace. And so we ate a lot of that. And um, one of my elders later on told me that for the Muncie people, uh, we had three major clans. I'm not sure if you know, but the Muncie people were the mountain people, uh, basically from New York down to Delaware Water Gap. This area, uh, the valley people were Unami people. And then we had the turkey people who were the ocean, the people living along the ocean. So we had those three major clans and then within them, many, many clans. Uh, but one of my Muncie elders told me that the, uh, the wild parrot was used as a contraceptive. And um, she, she did say that the Muncie people did, in her family at least, uh, did not have a lot of children. And so that could be one reason why, because uh, they love to eat the Queen Anne's lace. Uh, another really good thing that uh, we make for um, uh, vitamin C is white pine needles. You can use just about any pine needles, but the white pine are less bitter uh, than most. Um, a main, uh, and I don't think it was indigenous to this area, but a main uh, herb that we use constantly now is plantain. And plantain, not the bananas, the weed, uh, is uh, internally, uh, we call it life medicine now. Um, we used to say that it grew everywhere the white man stepped. Uh, so, um, but uh, it, it has been adopted for use. And uh, anyone who's allergic to bee stings, uh, anything like that, it really sucks the poison out of anything. Uh, don't ever prepare it in a metal can because it will suck the metal out of that. Use glass or something else. Um, but uh, you know, anyone who has an allergy to bee stings, and we teach this to our native youth, uh, that, and you can find it anywhere. It's everywhere. <laughs> Uh, when I've given talks on herbs before, uh, often I, I will do that in front of less knowledgeable, knowledgeable people than yourself. And so, you know, I, I bring this up that it's the main weed that grows in your yard. And so, you know, you have all these suburban lawns where they bring people in to get rid of the weeds. And then they go to their local spa or they get their Botox injection or Botox mm -hmm. injection or whatever. And I say to them, if you just leave the weeds, you know, you just pick the plantain. What I do is I, I make a tea out of it and then I freeze it in ice cube trays. So I have it all winter and it just feels, and it's also a cure for wrinkles. That's what I tell them. Um, <laughs> supposedly that's not why I use it, but um, it's nice because I have the, the ice cubes uh, full of plantain and I, it just feels so nice to rub that, you know, on your skin. It, it, it'll clear acne. All these people buying all of this stuff for acne and all of these skin diseases um plantain will clear that up it clears up any infection in fact my mother had a, a really nasty cyst on her back and um it's, my, it, it's funny how the knowledge seems to go every other generation because my mother mother didn't really follow all of this so much she knew about it because my grandmother had it around all the time but anyway um so I said oh yeah I can deal with that and I got a bunch of plantain and I put it on her back and put a bandage over it and uh, when she went to the doctor to have it removed, he said, there's not a bit of infection in here. And she, she called me the next day and said, it really itches, it really itches. She said, yeah, my daughter put some weeds on my back. I don't know. <laughs> um, so it really, I mean, everyone should know and it's everywhere, you know. Uh, I have even read uh, stories about, you know, uh, our traveling people on railways and hobos and that kind of thing. <laughs> It's something they eat because it's something they can find just about anyway. Um, so that one I think is is really good for people to know about. Um, right now the garlic mustard is out, uh, the wild garlic. And so that's really tasty. And you can put plantain 
in your salads too, but it doesn't have much of a taste and it's a little stringy. But the garlic mustard is really nice. I, I dry it and, um, you know, um, grind it up and then I sprinkle it, you know. You do have to be careful when you dry anything, which I'm sure many of you know because it becomes much more potent. So you have to be a little careful that way. Um, Anne was talking about nuts. Uh, we ate lots of kinds of nuts. We used acorns, uh, that, that, that was ground for flour. Uh, hickory nuts were a big deal. And also, uh, it was actually more popular to tap history, uh, tap hickory trees than maple trees for syrup way back then. Uh, another tree that was very important to our people was the tulip tree. That's what we made our uh, dugout canoes out of because it's so straight, it doesn't have knots. Um, and so that was our favorite tree for making our dugout canoes. The uh, bark of the oak tree is something else that we use. Um, and uh, willow, which I'm sure you must know about, which is basically what they make aspirin out of. That's an, an anti-inflammatory. Um, these are things that, that we continue to use uh, these days. Um, Another thing to talk about are all of the nice herbs that go into our knick, which is our smoking tobacco, which contains very little tobacco. I can say this, I'm allowed to say what goes into it, but I'm not allowed to write it down. And neither is anyone else. That's just our, what I have been told by my medicine society and my elders. Uh, but it's mainly, the main ingredients are sumac leaves, um, mullen leaves, are very fibery, coltsfoot, and bearberry, and then maybe a smidgen of tobacco. You know, we talk about tobacco being good for you, but that's only in moderation. Um, so all of these herbs that I just mentioned are actually good. Mullen, um, I don't know if you're aware, is just very good for uh, any type of inflammation or uh, congestion in the lungs. I finally, after many, many uh, months of not contracting it, contracted COVID. <laughs> and that was the main herb that I used during that time. The sumac leaves as well, the cold sweat and the beer berry are all very good for cleaning out the lungs or making the lungs more healthy. So uh, that's the main smoke, uh, or knick we call it, is the main uh, smoke that we use. Uh, different families, different tribes. May I, uh, at the, the, I'm, I'm talking about Eastern Woodlands. Um, so out west, I'm sure they have their own, you know, herbs that they might use. Um, <clears throat> um, some other things, uh, chicory is in a lot of coffees, but it's also good for stomach ailments as well as ginger. I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, I talked about sassafras with the white oak um, bark. That's a good gargle for sore throats. And um, another big one that my grandfather used to harvest was witch hazel. And I mean, you can buy that in the stores now. I don't know how that's uh, produced, uh, but if you get the herb, you know, from, from the tree, um, that's good for uh, various skin irritations and also a gargle for sore throat. I don't know if you can do that with the stuff in the in the, <laughs> in the drugstore. Um, another thing that was used widely for pains of childbirth was pokeweed leaves. It's a sort of a really intense pain reliever, but you don't want to eat the berries because they're poisonous, very poisonous, yes. Um, I remember one of my fondest, uh, Adam will remember this too. In our yard, we had giant buckballs. And he used to love to go stomp on them. Uh, but if you sprinkle puffball over a wound it, that is bleeding heavily, it will stop bleeding. That's good to know. Also, many varieties of mosses are natural antiseptics. If you're in the woods, which a lot of us are, you get a cut, you get a bruise, uh, some nice cool moss will help to keep it from getting infected. Puffballs aren't that easy to find. <laughs> we've we've had quite a few of them in our yard. Um, 
burdock also I wanted to mention uh, that's really good for eliminating poisons in the body. Um, and also the leaves of that can be used for poison ivy. Um, I think many of you may know that cure for poison ivy always grows near it and jewel weed, uh, as well as the plantain leaves and burdock leaves will relieve poison ivy if you get it on there quickly enough, even afterwards, even once you've got it, it helps. The plantain especially, because it, it's, it's an infection. And so it will, it will soothe that. Um, just trying to think of some other, make some notes about some that I didn't want to forget. But um, one thing that is really important to understand about the way Native Americans harvest herbs is that you have to realize that to them, everything is from creator. Everything is spiritual. Um, everything has a spirit. Um, the native view of the world is quite different, I think, from the non-native view. And that is that rather than geographical nations of two-leggeds all over the world, we don't see it that way. Uh, we see the nations of creation, which are the winged ones, the four-leggeds, the creepy crawlers, the sea creatures, the plant people. And to us, all of those nations, we're just the two-leggeds. We're just, so all of the human beings on the planet are one nation. Us. They're one species. And a lot of people will ask, well, what should we call you? Should we call you Indian? Should we call you Native American? And the best compliment that you can give any Native American is call us human being, because that is our nation and that's what we are. And if you look into the names of most Native American tribes, it will simply be some form of their language to mean human being person, common person, as ours is. Um, so we have a, an incredible amount of respect for all those nations, and we don't consider ourselves more important. Where would we be without the two-leggeds? I mean, without the four-leggeds. Where would we be without the winged ones? Where would we be without the bugs? You know, we need all of those. And we walk, as our chief says, softly on the earth. And I've taught my my students too, you know, we go for walks off and I'm like, don't step on the flowers. And they love to pick them and everything. And I'm like, okay, pick a few for your mom, but you know, don't grab them all and throw them, you know. Um, we need to have respect for them. And we make sure that when we harvest, we never take the first plant. We offer tobacco, we say a prayer, we give thanks for the bounty, and then we'll go to the next plant. And uh, that way we give respect to that relation of ours, as well as being sure that we would never deplete the species. There would always be something left behind. Uh, we also have great respect for elders in our tribe. Um, and again, I do a whole program just on the culture and, and that whole aspect. But I just wanted to let you know that that extends to all our relations. So uh, just as we would never shoot an elder deer, and again, we have great prayers that go with that. We would never take more than we need, you know. Um, the same with plants. We would never cut down an elder tree. Um, we would take what we need for our purposes. We would, uh, they were very well aware of how to, um, there's a specific word for it, but to, um, take out of the forest what is hindering the other plants um, so that the others will grow. Um, so they would so be very selective, you know, when they would have to make their lodges or anything like that uh, for the, the types of plants that they would choose. Um, I'm trying to think of, there was something else that I wanted to bring up before I finished. Um, about the way that we gathered things. But I think that's the main thing. The fact that um, we just have incredible respect for all of our relations. I never passed the meat section in the grocery store without praying for those poor animals and the way that they were uh, 
harvested, is <laughs> the word, uh, which is another way, uh, reason that I, I won't buy anything like that. Only, oh, I don't really, I only eat occasional white meat. I don't like red meat at all, unless it's venison. And those are fond memories that I have too. This isn't plants, but uh, our hunting. Uh, and I could talk a long time about how that was specifically done, but it was a big deal. And I remember as a child that I was allowed to grind the hamburger for the deer. I had this old, huge grinder and I was allowed to turn the handle. Um, but we had incredible respect for the deer. There were prayers that were said. We would never shoot an older deer like you see some me big hunters do so that they can have a rack to hang on their wall, which we would never do. We use that rack for alls and all kinds of things that we made. Um, we would choose one that was, you know, specific for our needs, prayers would be said. And um, we would use everything from the sinew to the brains for tanning to the skins, uh, everything would be used. And uh, one, one thing about, um, especially people that don't know Native Americans at all or children, and I, I like to explain this, is that they'll see different Native Americans wearing certain skins, feathers, you know, and they'll kind of say, ooh, you know, why are you wearing these animal skins and things? I mean, it can look a little creepy, I guess, to people. Um, but you have to realize that everything on, a rega on the regalia of a Native American has spiritual meaning. Uh, if you were from the wolf tribe, you might have some kind of regalia from there. Um, it also depends on what your spirit animal is, what, what talks to you. Um, I'm getting a little bit off the subject of plants, but I think it's kind of important because it's all connected. Um, and so they would believe that everything they got from that deer would carry on the spirit of that deer. So, um, all of that happens as well with plants. You know, any plants that are harvested, you take that into you and, and plants do have spirit. <laughs> you know, everything has some sort of consciousness. I mean, it is proven scientifically that plants will recoil from anger. They will recoil from uh, certain emotions, you know. Um, and um, I've, I've felt the healing of hugging a tree. So you can call me a tree hugger anytime you want. Uh, I have felt the healing just sitting there and, uh, you know, communicating um, with those. Um, and so, um, you know, I, something I wrote in the introduction to my book on the language, and then I'll, I'll finish. I don't know how much time is left. But um, uh, I, I was talking there about one time when I was in the uh, forest and um, uh, I was talking about how some people will look at Native Americans or other people who are well aware of the spiritual quality of plants and trees, um, and will you know talk to them as kind of you know crazy or primitive, you know, for feeling that way. And so uh, basically, I said the trees will respond to those people, but you know they'll just ignore the others. So um, so with that, I think I'll I'll end there and uh, if you have questions. All right, folks, I think what we're going to do is let Adam and Shelly take some questions from the room, and then um, I'll jump in and take the questions from our friends on Zoom. So just give me the signal when you, um, oh, but one special detail. You can repeat the question in the room into the microphone so our friends on Zoom can hear it. All right, do we have questions? I see John in the back. Um, he asked about our custom that there are some things that we can say out loud but not write down. I thought you were going to answer that. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, most of our medicinal knowledge, our history, everything is oral. Um, we don't write much down. You won't find many history books even written by Lenape people. They're all written by experts. 
Um, and I won't go any further on that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but yes, no, uh, it's, it's really ingrained in us. And Adam is storyteller can, can tell you this, story keeper. Um, our custom is to hand thing, you know, pass things down orally. Um, and a lot of the reason for that is so that things are not written in stone. Uh, the Lenape did believe in, in change and adapting, you know, uh, that's how they, they survived for many years. And um, once you write something down, it's, you know, how that is. And then people get to interpret it and, you know, misinterpret it and you have different sex going out of, of types of things. So, um, no, definitely in our culture, in fact, uh, I've partnered with a number of uh, organizations and then the first thing they'll say to me is, well, you can, can you provide us with a history of, you know, a written history of your people? And I'm like, no, I can refer you. I, I mean, if this is something that you want, we'll need to arrange a time where we can speak orally together. And you have to realize too, since the diaspora, the history of all of our people is tragic. The history of those who were removed to Oklahoma is tragic and Canada and Wisconsin, it's tragic, but also the history of those who remained here is tragic. So each of us sort of have our own history, you know, of how things have developed since that time and what has remained and what we remember. Um, but again, uh, most of our traditions from our people who have remained here, there have been a few exhibits now done to bring more academic credibility, if that's what's important to people, to the story of the Lenape who remained in Pennsylvania. There was a, uh, an exhibit that was done and was the first time it was actually co-curated by the people themselves at the University of Pennsylvania, wonderful people there, who were the first really academically to tell the story of the Lenape. Um, nation of Pennsylvania, people who remained in Pennsylvania. Um, and then there are other authorities on the subject too uh, that have uh, written some articles. Is there any ancient language? Is there, is there any ancient language? Now there is. <laughs> we never wrote our language down. Our language was, uh, oh, you don't want to get me talking on the language, but I'll, I'll try to be brief. <laughs> On Kelly about <laughs> YouTube channel. To answer your question quickly, uh, no, we had no written language. The language was written down by the many linguists who were interested in studying it, and they each had their own spelling system. I can vouch for that. Um, so putting it back together was tricky. Also, um, we have to give credit to the Moravian missionaries who in their efforts to convert us to Christianity translated the Bibles into our language. So they were the first to write it down and find a way to write it down so they could speak the Bible to us. And, and although the conversion efforts uh, were scattered here and there, uh, they did help to save the language for us. But originally, no, we did not write it down. Yeah. Could, you, could you explain the way that a person would get their spirit animal, like if you're giving to a baby or a person like a the, the idea of having one spirit animal is one that has been very uh, popularized and aggrandized and in many ways cheapened and publicized by Hollywood. Now, it is absolutely a traditional way in many Native American tribes, but the first thing I've heard is that you forget anything you've seen in movies about spirit journeys and spirit animals. Um, it's a good question you ask, and I know you were going in to answer that. I just wanted to preface that because mm -hmm. there is no one way to tell you, um, except to say, don't follow what you see on um, but please. I have to quote uh, my chief Bob Redhawk on this one and he says watch which way the ants are crawling um, watch which way the birds are flying 
uh, if you get continually followed by a porcupine, pay attention, or a hawk, or it will speak to you. It's just a matter of waking yourself up to what is speaking to you. So I think if everyone, you know, you just kind of open your mind when you're taking a walk, you're going to notice something speaking to you. And I really, and, and that's the whole idea of the vision quest, you know, for our youngsters to go out into the woods and to see what is speaking to them or that sort of thing. Um, it's a matter of awakening yourself to things around you because we kind of walk along thinking about what do I got to do today? Da, 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 da. We walk through the woods and we've got our, you know, earphones on playing our music. Um, that's not the way to listen. The way to listen is to just be totally aware. And you have to be aware that there is communication with you from the plants, the animals. And if you're open to that and it will come to you. And that is how Chief Bob explains it. And I think that's the best way. Yes. I'm sorry, I forgot to repeat the last question. Um, the first question was about how one attains uh, the idea of a spirit animal or, or an animal totem. And the last comment was just um, graciously thanking uh, about this knowledge of these plants that are in this area. And for people in the room, if you don't know, I've been asked to repeat the questions so people in Zoom can hear them. <laughs> woman in the brown shirt. <laughs> The, the question is, do these plants come up in our stories? And um, my my first question, I'm going to bounce this back to Ruffian. How long do I have to answer this question? <laughs> Good, okay. Um, so it is central to everything it means to be Lenape, to live in a harmonious relationship with all of our relations, the four-leggeds, the creepy crawlers, the plant people, the grandfather stones. When I say it's central to everything it means to be Lenape, I don't just mean it's, it's something we choose to do or like to do. It goes back to our most ancient stories, our stories of creation, of cosmology, how the world was made, how we were able to survive here. To be Lenape means to be in a good relationship with what in English we would call the environment. We don't have a word in the Lenape language that translates into environment, or at least that translates well. When you say that word in English, environment, you're drawing a line, right? You're drawing a line between yourself and the rest of nature. That's your environment. You're going to go do something to the environment. Um, our language doesn't make that division. So um, we still today, we are first and foremost, a tribal entity, a cultural community. We hold our traditional ceremonies, uh, our major seasonal ceremonies, and as well as many other situational ceremonies like marriage ceremonies or naming ceremonies. But our significant seasonal ceremonies almost all revolve around a story about some kind of plant or hunting, some way of providing food. And many of those stories act in a way as cautionary tales. In the summer, we tell the story of Mother Corn and the time that we almost lost the corn that was so important to our people, it literally began to fly away because we weren't observing responsible farming practices, responsible uh, horticultural practices. Um, we told the story of the uh, uh, maple tree in the spring where we learned how our people almost starved uh, or actually dehydrated over a long winter 
uh, but were finally uh, given the gift of syrup from maple tree. Um, one that I think is very important to mention, even though this doesn't involve a specific plant, I like to bring up Mising. Mising is one of our most important culture heroes. In our creation story and in our emergence story, we two-leggeds, all of us two-leggeds, we are the last creation. Everything else was created before us, all of our relations. And then when it came finally time to make the two-leggeds, uh, we almost didn't make the cut. All of our animal relations got together, and this was so early on, everyone was still participating very closely in, in Kisho and Mugong and Creator's Dream, uh, that the animals got together and said, these two-leggeds are going to be trouble. They're going to muss things up. Uh, and they went to Mising, who is one of our culture heroes, the protector of the animals, and they said, Mising, you got to go talk Creator out of this. Don't stop here. We're good. Um, now, this is a whole other story, one of the basis of one of our most important ceremonies, and I, I don't have the time to go into all that. It involves uh, talking, um, arguments being made, me seeing getting hit in the face with a mountain. Uh, you all know how this ends because we're here today. So the two leggeds were created, but we were created with conditions. And those conditions were that we would be taught responsible hunting, responsible horticulture, ways of uh, treating our environment responsibly. Uh, and if we forgot those ways, that the plants, the deer, and everything we depend on would be taken from us. And there are some rather observant uh, Lenape people in recent years who have looked around at the loss of some of our animal species, at the loss of some of our plant species, and wondered, if that's not starting to come through in the way we two-leggeds have forgotten responsible, harmonious relationship with our plants and animals. Um, but uh, yes, I'll specifically mention, just to wrap it up, we have very important stories revolving maple. Cedar tree is one of our most important ceremonial stories. Uh, cedar tree is one of the ways that the earth was rebuilt on the flood, uh, on the flood waters on the back of the turtle. Uh, and I also like to bring up, like Clan Mother Shelley said, tobacco. Tobacco is an incredibly important uh, plant for our people. We have a story of how tobacco was given to us, how the first pipe was given to us. Uh, but just like Clan Mother Shelley alluded to, Creator did not give us Philip Morris. Um, <laughs> he gave us sacred medicine, and I'm saying this as a smoker, which is uh, doubly a shame on me as someone who, who is irresponsible with my health, but also abuses a sacred medicine. I have two reasons to, to get back to our traditional ways. Um, but even in that medicine, uh, those things are used sparingly and to bring us together in a good way. And we have uh, many stories that caution us out of abusing those things. Cranberries too. Manishi. Cranberries, we have story oh, about many other, I can't there's, name all of them. There's all kinds of stories about yeah. <laughs> I'm a smoker too, but I only smoke organic tobacco. <laughs> Good to know. Or I think flat. It reminds me of the bones. The idea of that's a fascinating question and the question is uh what is the idea of the soul in our beliefs um you know does the soul rise does it ascend is there a soul is there a mind body problem i'm operating or but uh but what is that concept and i could spend three days answering this um but, but I'm going to try to do it very briefly in just saying, first of all, it's vastly important to understand that Lenape people are as diverse as any other community and that our Lenape people have many different belief systems. We have Lenape Christians of all denominations, Lenape Jewish people, Lenape Hindu people, 
we also have many people who are who their spirituality as well as their culture is Lenape. So uh, there's never an answer to what do Lenape people believe? Our people believe all, all kinds of different things. Um, but as far as our traditional stories and what our sacred stories tell us, the idea of the soul is not one that comes across in the same way as we're probably familiar um, in, say, the, the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, even though much of that has uh, uh, much to do with the Zoroastrian tradition for it. Um, we, something that is, I find, just so warming and wonderful about our stories is that even the most severe, even the most important um, subjects are, are addressed with a lightheartedness. Our people talk to the deceased, are sometimes contacted by them, talk to the ancestors. The ancestors might speak to them in dreams, they might speak to them through plants, or like Mother Shelley mentioned, they might speak to you through animals if you watch closely enough. Uh, but there is no doctrine of what this thing is when you die. Is there a thing? Does it go to a certain place? Our stories will talk of a young Lenape person walking through the wood, and suddenly their ancestor speaks to them on the wind. And then they continue on uh, with no further explanation of the metaphysics of how that would be possible. Um, that wasn't very important to our people to know why because they participated in their culture and um, analyzing it to that rigorous extent that we're used to in Western rationalist tradition has never been, um, as far as I can tell from all my research and from talking to my elders, something that we're uh, very uh, obsessed with. Um, so we know our ancestors speak to us, we know they guide us, uh, but if you're looking for a, uh, a Lenape Kant or Descartes that's going to try to explain how that might happen. I don't think you're going to. And then maybe one more, and then we might move to some Zoom questions. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I have a question about gender in Lenape society question about gender in Lenape society? Um, traditionally, um, men and women had uh, very specific roles. We still do follow some of those traditions to this day. Uh, the men did the hunting um, and the women did almost all of the agriculture, which is one of the reasons that we got along well with the early colonists. Uh, many of them came here to farm and back in the 1600s when they got here, uh, they found that Lenape women were really helpful with farming and they didn't mind getting out there and dirty and digging and planting, and <clears throat> which some of the European women weren't uh, willing to do. I don't know how I got digressed on that, but um, uh, so there were very specific gender roles uh, traditionally. Um, it's important also getting back to the elders to talk about how the family structure was. It would be the grandparents that would teach the children because moms and dads would be busy uh, doing things, like cooking, cleaning. I mean, you can imagine what it was like to live back then. Um, so it would be the grandparents that would teach the, the young ones and um, there were also, uh, we did have gay people, what you would refer to as gay people back then, whom we revered as two-spirited. So um, that was a really important thing. Um, it was really important for the elders to watch the children. And um, that was one of their main goals and to, to lead them on their path because our Elders believe that uh, everyone has a sacred path, a gift, everyone in this room, everyone everywhere. And if you're on that path, then you're going to be the happiest and you are going to contribute to the tribe in the best way. So there was no following in the footsteps of your father. 
uh, it was up to the elders to find, to watch the children as they played and help to guide them on, on their um, specific spiritual path. Um, so uh, other than that, um, you had to be, the children had to be a certain age, uh, the young men before the young boys, before they could sit with the men. And at least there, there's a protocol of respect in our society and a lot of pride comes with that. So a child had to wait till they were a certain age and then they could go with the men and hunt and that was a big deal. Uh, same with the girls, you know, they could sit and weave baskets with the women at a certain age and that was a big deal. Um, and so we follow some of those traditions today, although, as I said, will not be people adapt, you know, and so there are changes, but basically it's best to remember that we do believe that a, each person has a path. And so in these modern times, you know, if a woman has a path that might in the olden times have seen as more of a masculine uh, path because they didn't have all these different convergent paths way back, um, that's okay, you know, so. We have one more in the room. I'm sorry. I just want to elaborate, uh, or not elaborate, but add a few more things because that's a fascinating question. Mm -hmm. um, and the question of how, of how gender stereotypes have been applied to our community is a fascinating one. Um, and it involves uh, wars at times. It involves some uh, tribes taking advantage of European gender stereotypes telling people that we were ruled by old women, so we should be no uh, trouble getting out of our land. Yeah. Um, some people, I hear people sometimes refer to us as matriarchal. I push back against that term. Uh, I don't think that applies. I find that what some of the people mean when they say matriarchal, they mean to say matrilineal. And we are, a matrilineal society and have always been matrilineal. And what that means, um, the way it plays out in our culture is, as your mother Shelley mentioned, we have three clans. And uh, if a Lenati was uh, encouraged to marry outside of your clan, so if you were a wolf clan, you were encouraged to marry a turtle Lenati or a turkey Lenati, part of that uh, came to avoid inbreeding. When a Lenape man would marry a Lenape woman, he took his wife's clan. He became her clan, and it is tradition for him to go live with her family and become a member of her society. Um, our clan lines and our living lines traditionally went through the female line, and that's matrilineal. Matriarchal, um, I don't like the word matriarchal because to me that summons up ideas of the aristocracy of some kind of empress um, handing down orders through divine rights. Okay. Uh, and that I resist, but it is uh, very important to, to understand that our people have always been uh, led in large part by the wisdom of our elder women. Today, um, you have two of our clan mothers here and our clan mothers continue that tradition um, where uh, some of the most respected elder women in our tribe who have seen the most life, who have raised children, who have seen the way the lives they've read, read, uh, raised have been directed, um, they advise us chiefs, they advise the council in difficult decisions and in all things, but particularly in difficult decisions uh, regarding what is best for the nation. And uh, again, uh, it's not a matriarchy. Uh, there's no written Lenape creed that says, uh, should a chief not agree with a clan mother, they will be uh, excommunicated from the Lenape society. Um, but I can tell you that if the clan mothers offer us guidance, uh, find it, think that they should do so and offer us their counsel, if we as chiefs were to disregard that without even considering it or open up uh, a conversation and just go ahead with whatever we wanted to do anyway, we would not be chiefs for long. <laughs> and that's not by any political decree. That's not because we would get kicked out uh, by our clan mothers, but the people would not support us because we did not have the respect of our women. 
who have always uh, helped us in the and I'd just like to add one quick thing, which Anne will attest to and has taught us again and again. And that is that we are an egalitarian society. So although there are certain amounts of respect given, no one is more important than anyone else. The chief, that's his job. Clan mothers, that's their job. The people who collect the garbage, that's their job. Doctors, that's their job. Every job is sacred and as important as any other job, and no one is esteemed in Lenape culture above any other person in the tribe. We are all equally important, because where would you be without the person who picks up your garbage? Where would you be without the person who fixes your car? And now I'm talking modern times, but that's where we are, so. Are you ready for a few Zoom questions? Um, I'm trying to think, did you, um Plug the little mic and then I'll read the questions and pass the mic back to you and it'll be really fun. <laughs> All right, hopefully everyone in the room can hear me and everybody Zoom and I'm going to find my questions. Zoomers, I'm going to prioritize because you covered a lot. So I'm going to prioritize questions on plants. <laughs> <laughs> we digress. What can I say? <laughs> well, so do our questions, but um, focus on plants to start. Um, could you share, could you share the Lenape names of some of the native plants you mentioned? That is very difficult um, because many of those names have been lost. Um, I do have a list at home of some of the plants that we have been able to keep. Uh, you have to realize that our, our language has only been collected by linguists and uh, Nora Thompson Dean who is one of our uh, esteemed elders who uh, put out some lessons on the language. One thing that she loved was birds. There's pages and pages of birds, but very few Lenape names of plants uh, left in the culture. Okay. All right, do you have a favorite way to introduce harvesting or caretaking of plants with children? Anne, did you want to address that? Address, addressing harvesting and caretaking of plants to children? Nope. Okay, here. You're muted, Anne. Can you unmute? And then if you want to, if we're going to have Anne answer, if you want to take the microphone and put it towards the back, it's actually the back. It's the back. And From other end, we can't hear you. Uh, are you able to unmute? She might be having. Okay. <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> the question was do we have uh, uh, prominent or preferred ways of passing knowledge of things like harvesting and horticulture onto our youth? I, I've seen so many different models. Um, I didn't know much about being Indian when all the years I lived in Philadelphia area. Um, it was a family issue for us. Um, and so I really had to return to Oklahoma to learn about all the different tribes and all the concerns and the issues. Um, the public is just now becoming aware of the damage done by the boarding schools. Apparently Canada is now trying to say, well, they're not gonna change their minds after all. Um, what was done to families and to um, well, to everyone who was sent to a boarding school was just unbelievable. And um, I didn't know until after my mother died that uh, her younger sister told me that they tried to put them in boarding schools. And I didn't know that all those years. Um, and I had a German grandmother who said, no, they're German, you're not taking them. <laughs> And she was a force to be dealt with. And so they didn't have to go to boarding schools. 
but the the kinds of things that have happened um and they're not just our indigenous people um through all kinds of issues of of uh, being there at the right time i've learned so much more about indigenous peoples worldwide and the kinds of common concerns and so how we pass the knowledge on is very related to what people's uh, history is the intergenerational trauma we now have a name for it um and people will um uh, are still afraid to do anything but what uh europeans have told them they can do and so how do we pass on this knowledge in terms of um you know i'm there's so many spellings we have now for the lenape language every time i put some in my computer or whatever then the spelling is changed again but and so of course we didn't have that spelling but one of the things i'm coming to is that our icons are cellular you know different things that we have that we can choose from every time we go online um have ways of communicating things like what i call cave art where the picture said things larger than the words did and that's a very new understanding if i hadn't had to or wanted to you know use those icons for birthdays or whatever and say no that's not the right one for this person um there are some special icons that i use now for certain people and one of them means blessings um and it's a feather and it's feet and so blessings along your way uh i haven't told most most people what those mean but the more i look i i one of my um former faculty members uh at penn university of pennsylvania um was a demographer uh he was cherokee um but later on in his work he um he analyzed all the different kinds of of uh cave art and buffalo um drawings and it should have been just kind of cut and dry but it was a, one of the most emotional experiences i've ever had in reading a book um so we uh, we passed down languages different ways as some of you may have noticed I, i'm hard of hearing um my mouth gets dry so um uh, i tend to do more writing now just because well i can write it um if i can't speak it clearly and that's a decision i'm having to make uh it's very frustrating uh of all the challenges i think having trouble hearing is one of the worst um so we have different ways and we learn different ways to communicate and one of the ways i communicate and one of my uh viewers um uh, i see is here is i i post a picture of a wolf every day and every day if i don't try to post one at 2 to 2:30 in my time someone's waiting <laughs> and my husband has taken so many photos of wolves i think you were talking earlier on about communication with animals and i learned so much from the wolves they learned to communicate in ways that i didn't know how they figured it out but they did and so um how we communicate what we share what we show um is very important and um no i'm not writing a, i'm not going to do a book on wolves however i'm thinking about some interesting ways to portray their lives and what they've taught us differently so there are a lot of ways we communicate and part of how we communicate is how we live what we do how we our actions um what's important to us how we spend our our time so i don't know if that goes past the question or not one issue um i also want to just take a very quick second to bring in wisdom from another one of our clan mothers our clan mother terry is fine who is our keeper of traditional craft and that involves many things many of our uh, handy work beading pine needle weaving 
but it also includes the craft of teaching. <clears throat> and uh, she gave words to something that I never had in my consciousness, but once she said it, I realized how true it is, even in my own passing on of our stories to our youths. It's uh, traditionally, we are not much on direct instruction. We're not much on sit in a chair and we will tell you how to do things and you will repeat after me. When she talks about passing on ways of beating or pine weaving, and I will, won't do this justice because she says this much better than I do, um, but she says in, in broad strokes, the child sits beside you. And if you're weaving a basket, the child gets the needles and begins weaving. And you might not talk at all, or if you talk, you might start talking about piecing or some stories. And meanwhile, while the child is listening, they will mimic you. Um, and if the child does something wrong, you don't say, no, no, wait, don't do that. This is the way to do it. You might not even stop telling that story, but you'll take it from them. You'll undo the wrong part and you'll start doing the right part, hand it back. And a certain amount of time later, um, you might have been talking about uh, wonderful stories for an hour and the child might have to have the basket. Um, I would suspect she would say that's also how we might pass on the knowledge of agriculture. Get the children in the field with you, let them watch and follow along. Um, and meanwhile, share and enjoy the experience with them. And I'd just like to add, just like to add to that, that that's what we do. Uh, we have a corn planting ceremony every year coming up, talking about roles. It is the women that do the corn planting and the young girls are out there with them doing the corn planting while the men are um, drumming behind us. And the same thing, I mean, I've taught our youth. Uh, we do have a youth that is allergic to bee snakes. So I've taught him how to use the planting. And so uh, our youth do come along with us to do gathering and that sort of thing. And um, we also have uh, a tradition where uh, we bring our youth with us to when we get cultural programs so that they can learn how to do those as well. So um, yeah, one thing that I was always taught is that uh, um, we do not dictate on how to do things. If a person would come to an elder with a question, they'll do one of two things. They'll either tell you a story and then you have to figure out what that story had to do with anything you were asking about. <laughs> or they'll say, go to the woods. And I think we've talked enough about that to know what that means. All right, I'm passing over. Okay, um, so maybe this is a basic question. I'm not sure, it's so long, but uh, one question is, what foods were made with oak flour? But I'm not sure, maybe they mean acorn flour? I think yeah, so. I think I don't acorn. think we're grinding up the whole tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, we made flour from acorns. And um, I don't know. Did you make some bread? Oh, yeah. yeah. Also with the plantain, uh, the little seeds that grow from the plantain, we made flour out of that. And uh, we, as far as I know, we did not eat the acorns. And you know anything about acorns? <laughs> I don't know if she can. There's a whole lot of things that happen in the background in order to answer. Oh, okay, okay. So that, that, okay. What I will say um, is that we have our table set up in the back. Uh, we have a number of books and resources and other things. Two of the books we have there, one of them is a plant medicine book, and one of them is a cookbook, the Lenape Harvest Book. And it has recipes that are both pre-colonial uh, traditional and also some of those things that became introduced to us, but we use so much that people think they are traditional, things like fry bread and other things that uh, got us into some dietary trouble. Um, but if you're in the room, uh, there are those recipes available back there. If you're online, um, within the next week, we should have those available on our website uh, online. We're getting ready to open our online training post. All right. Um, okay, as long as it's a plant question. Um, 
But also, sometimes witnesses later, and even to use poisons to get rid of them. So I was wondering what your perspective was on that to sort of the balance of the ecosystem, both with had a healthy ecosystem, but you know, a person don't want to be used for poisons to add to disruption. Oh, absolutely. Um... The question okay. was, uh, what's the Lenape perspective on modern ways of, for instance, using poison to promote plant, plant growth or, or ways that are harmed? Well, specifically to try to go back to a state where mostly native plants, and so the poison plants that come later to restore the native are mixed up plants that's now natives and more recent arrivals. So how do we navigate now the, the invasive species and how do we feel about ways to get back to indigenous plants through poisoning or ways that might be harmful to the environment? I am not um, specifically knowledgeable about the exact everything that's involved with that. We do have people in our communities that are beginning organic gardening, and they know a lot about certain plants that attract certain bugs that will get rid of certain other bugs. Uh, so obviously we don't use any chemicals. Uh, I have never used any chemicals on our, on our lawn, uh, but there are movements to replant native grasses, which root deeper. We do rid it invasive species along the river. There are people, uh, many of our treaty signers are involved in that kind of project, but we do have people that uh, are uh, planting, doing organic farming, and that have, I can't give you the specific knowledge, but they could on exactly what plants to plant to attract these bugs, that'll get rid of these bugs, et cetera. And I'm sorry, I can't be more professional about that. But I do like to say that uh, Chief Man from the uh, Ramapo in uh, New Jersey, is very much involved in his gardening project, which now is at a point where he can feed his people pretty well. Um, and so he's doing a really good job of that. Um, I also want to add to that, that I give a lot of talks, but many of us give many talks uh, on environmental issues. And we're often asked questions like, you know, what do your people do? Uh, what are the traditional ways of cleaning the rivers, of handling pollution? And something important to realize is that uh, we today in the contemporary world face many challenges that our ancestors never did. Of course, our ancestors faced many challenges that we will never see in our life, but our ancestors never had to worry about coming up with a way to get microplastics out of the water, mitigate uh, industrial fracking waste, right? Uh, these are challenges that have been induced, introduced to us through colonialism, through industrialization. Now, we are incredibly fortunate that through 20 years of uh, conducting the Rising Nation River Journey and the signing of the Treaty of Renewed Friendship every four years since 2002, we have uh, created partnerships with amazing environmental institutions, organizations, that have helped us navigate our traditional role as stewards of the environment in today's world. Um, some of our very first treaty signers 20 years ago are places like the Friends of the Wissahickon, the Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic, uh, the amazing Delaware River Keepers, and Naya Van Rossum. Um, as I said, I'm honored to be on the board for Friends of the Wissahickon, so honored to be our nation's representative on the council for Lower Delaware Wild and Scenic. And these people have such better brains than I do for these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And they have their fingers on the pulse of the litigation of the industrial happenings 
and that they help keep us informed and keep us involved so we can uh, know because the state of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has failed to recognize any people, uh, nobody has to deal with us. Nobody has to ask our permission if they wanna build a warehouse, if they wanna frack the stream. Um, so we are very thankful to our environmental partners and treaty signers who invite us into that conversation so we can stand with them, become more educated on how to fill that traditional role in the contemporary world and take action. Think, folks, um, on Zoom, I'm going to answer two questions that I can. That is, that there will be a recording of this, and that there are books on the on the topic of tonight's discussion that will be available soon on the Monopoly Nation of PA website. Um, and then I think I'm going to let us wrap up. I know that you've uh, agreed to stay, and you have some you have the books in the in the bar. And uh, maybe we'll take a few questions as people peruse. And uh, I just also want to add the thanks of the folks that have come through on Zoom for you taking time. Uh, Clay Mother Anne out in Oklahoma, who has sat through Zoom uh, on the big screen here with us. And Chief Adam, <laughs> and Mother Shelley, so much time and uh, sharing your, your knowledge and. Um, answering a wide variety of questions beyond plants. I think we have a number of threads that could be future whole conversations with you. So I know you'll be back. And uh, why doesn't everyone join me? And uh, one second,